And now, and it's now, time for it's TJ, time for wow. TJ Wow. Wow. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world and when you are watching this recording. This is me, Joe Cook. I'm your host on the Training Journal webinar. Really excited to be with you. And one of the reasons we have this webinar is because what we want are conversations. We don't want the presentations that you get everywhere else. We actually want to converse with people that know about the topic. And this is a quote from the late, great Jay Cross saying, the conversation is the most powerful learning technology ever invented. And seeing as we're focusing on AI today, I thought I would highlight the learning technology element of it. Now we've got that chat window. You can use that to chat with each other. Please put in there any links that you know of, any recommendations, anything that you like, because that's a great way to link with each other, talk with each other, find out, for instance, like we just did, all about Worthing, um, so that you can network with each other and get in contact with each other afterwards through Twitter, through LinkedIn, however it might be. Also, what you'll notice at the very bottom of your screen, you have a Q and A area. If you want to make sure that you get your questions seen, I promise, 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 I will see it if you put it in the question and answer area. So we will go and have a look at those a little bit later on. And also, we're on tw on Twitter, obviously. John is our editor of Training Journal, and he will be going and tweeting out all sorts of different things. So you can join us on Twitter as well, share your learning points, share some of the content that's coming up in there, and Don's already sharing some bits and pieces. And, and just tell us what you think and what you're learning. Also, what you can do is you can invite your colleagues if you want to. If you're thinking, actually, this looks pretty good and some of my colleagues should be here as well, you can just copy and paste what I've typed in there through email or social media and get people in. So as I say, we're recording our sessions. It's available publicly on our website later on this week. And uh, you can look at all of the previous webinars that we've got there as well. I think it's about time that we moved into our main area and find out a little bit more about our speakers. So we have Steve, Donald and Trish all with us. Let me bring them in on video and they can wave a lovely hello to you. And what we're going to do is get started with just a few really quick introductions. We're going to find out what they do and where they work. Let's start with Steve, then Donald, then Trish. So Steve, what is it that you do and where do you work? Um, well, I'm a futurist, which means uh, I look at some of the trends uh, and some of the disruptive factors that we see starting to emerge in our world and try to build some context around them so people can think about the kind of things they might need to put in place to develop resilient and robust strategies. Uh, we do three things in Fast Future. We do uh, speaking and presentations at public and client events. We do strategic consultancy around the future, and we publish books about the future. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve, for that lovely introduction. And Donald, let's come to you. Let's get you unmuted, and let's find out about what is it that you do. Okay, and where good do you morning, work. everyone. Uh, I, yeah, I don't really have a job, but <laughs> uh, I, I, I spent a lot, most of my adult life in learning and technology. I founded and ran a big e-learning company, floated it on the stock market, sold that in 2005. That was Epic, now Leo Learning. I now run an AI and learning company called Wildfire. That's Wildfire Learning, or one word, .co.uk. I, I do a lot of speaking all around the world on this particular topic, AI, artificial intelligence and learning. do some teaching in universities. So blogging, speaking, usual stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. And then let's move to Trish. And Trish, you are in New Zealand at the moment. You've been at the ATD conference over there. And what is it that you do? Everybody. So uh, Trish Ewell. So yep, I'm live from Auckland, New Zealand. It's my first time actually in New Zealand. Um, I actually work with building out analytical and AI capabilities with learning and development teams around the world. So that's part of what it is that I'm doing here uh, down in the southern hemisphere. I'm originally, actually, I'm uh, typically based out of Chicago, um, but I, uh, I like working with high-performing uh, L&D teams in trying to help us figure out you know, what it is to be a uh, modern learning professional in this particular day and age as quickly as things are changing. Brilliant. 
Brilliant. Well, we've definitely got the right people with us today then. That sounds excellent. Thank you. Now, our question today, as you all know, we have an opening question. We don't plan any other questions, any other backups. We just go with this. And uh, our question today is, what does artificial intelligence mean for learning and development role in organizations? So we're going to get just some very quick headline thoughts to get us started on this. Let's go to Trish, then Don, then Steve. So Trish, very quickly, what are your first thoughts about what AI um, So I see it from actually uh, three different lenses. There's um, artificial intelligence as do it yourself. There's artificial intelligence as do it with you. And there's artificial intelligence as do it for you. And I think um, we've uh, been paying attention to maybe one of those three things and not all three of those lenses. So very quickly, we tend to think of artificial intelligence as a disruptor. That's something that's coming into the learning function and disrupting our role. That's definitely true. Um, and because of that, uh, there are ad hoc services that we can use around artificial intelligence. But I don't think that people really know that there are a lot of packaged artificial intelligence solutions that are available now that are disintermediating, that are already disrupting the learning function in a, in a variety of different roles. And that's, that's what I'm excited um, with this panel in particular to talk about today, because it's both um, something that's changing who we are and what we do, and it's also becoming the latest tool in our toolkits. Great introduction. Thank you, Trish. And Donald, what are your first thoughts on how AI is going to affect L&D's role in organizations? Well, I suppose that's framed in the future te uh, tense, but uh, it already has. We've been using Google for 20 years, which is pure AI, of course, nothing but AI. In fact, one little algorithm called PageRank, that certainly rocked the boat in terms of learning. But as Trish said, AI is many things. And uh, I think right across, if we're talking about L&D, right across the learning journey, from learning engagement uh, into learning support into the AI, using AI to create content, using AI to curate content, using AI for spaced practice in terms of the consolidation of learning. There's AI in assessment. There's AI in well-being. AI, I mean, the, the, the bottom line here is that AI will not only change what we learn, it will change how we learn and why we learn. The reason for that, of course, is that anybody in HR and L&D who's not looking at AI isn't really playing a professional game because it's going to completely shape the employment landscape. You know, there's how, I, and I don't want to get carried away with the hype here because it won't shape it as rapidly, I think, as people imagine. Or, uh, the people who work in AI certainly don't think so. It, it's it's a rather dumb, brute thing at the moment. But to imagine it's not going to change the world and change learning is naive. Okay, so it's naive if you think it's not going to change learning. Thank you very much, Don. And Steve, what are your headline thoughts around our question of... I think there's probably a question one step back for me, which is um, how is AI going to affect life, society and business more generally? Because I think it's once we get behind those questions that we can maybe start to apply the responses to those questions in, a, in a, um, an L&D context. Uh, I, I mean, I disagree with Donald to some extent in that I think we're at the precipice of just some incredible radical change that will continue to accelerate. So, for example, I see more change in the next 20 years than we've seen in the last 300. And I think a lot of that will be AI driven. Um, I see us changing our workforces between a mix of um, normal humans, enhanced humans, robots, artificial intelligence, holograms. I see a significant change in the way that people are employed. Uh, and all that, I think, leads to a radical change in the way that we think about um, how we resource and therefore train up the resources that we have available to our organizations. So I think if we're looking at, uh, uh, at really putting, uh, putting some flexible strategies in place, then I think it's that longer term perspective, particularly in bigger organizations, that we really need to think about right now. <coughs> 
Thank you, Steve. And uh, Michelle Paris later in the chat window has said that we have to change attitudes to AI in organisations first, and that many organisations are naturally risk averse and conservative, and AI seems one step too much at the moment. Um, and Marco, um, I'm assuming that's Marco Ficini, is saying that Michelle raises a good point and wonder if there's a fear factor around AI. So, so let me come to Trish on this one. Trish, do you think there's a fear factor around artificial uh, No. <laughs> no. Um, operations, it's in operations. I mean, to Donald and Steve's points, I mean, I, you know, we've had artificial intelligence in a number of different areas in organizations. And I was actually just um, typing into the chat. I was at the ATD conference in San Diego before I came down to New Zealand. And a lot of the conversation there in talking about, again, some of these packaged platforms, um, people in training, learning, talent are not aware. So they don't know about, you know, things like wildfire that we can use now for instructional design or um, platforms like Scalytics that we can use um, for performance support across the board. Um, and, and that being said, in having conversations with others in our industry, um, it, it was interesting to watch the reaction when they became aware of some of these uh, technologies and that, uh, again, to Donald's point, these aren't starting. These are now at a state of maturity that are becoming actually available. They're scaling. Um, they're coming out of stealth mode. Um, they've been around. They've got clients. They've got use cases. So it's not that our organizations are scared, but we're scared, and, and we should be to a certain degree because it, it does radically change where it is that we contribute value and, and, and what value we as learning professionals or training professionals or talent development professionals that we create. And so real quick, you know, there were people that said, like, Trish, if my organization knew that XYZ tool was available right now, like, there would be redundancy across the board in the training department. Um, and uh, in my mind, um, there should be. Uh, if, if we're only performing at a level of transaction, if that's all it is that we can contribute value is by providing content, um, then we should be looking for another job. I think you make a great point there, Trish, about looking for another job if you're going to be affected that much. That's something that I spoke to Don about in, in our kind of pre-webinar kind of conversation. So, so Don, we're talking here about lots of different change that's happening and, and also the, the fear factor for maybe individuals. So Marco is saying, for instance, operations embrace it, but do L&D. What are you seeing from, from a learner professional point of view? Well, Michelle made an interesting point earlier on here, which is there is genuine fear because people don't really know what it is, first of, and it's many, many things, of course, but neither should they know what it is. I think the idea of training L&D professionals up in machine learning and so on is a rather futile task, but uh, they certainly need to understand the changes, as Steve said, but those changes for L&D aren't really that radical, I don't think. I think there are some really practical things that people can look at. I think one of the things that will happen immediately is chatbots, uh, you know, that sort of a Socratic method of learning and teaching, which was really destroyed by the blackboard, the whiteboard, and PowerPoint, that will come back in. I'm already seeing I'm involved in several chatbot projects where it sits above the LMS, as it were, or above your content, and finds things for you. There are tutor chatbots. There are mentoring chatbots. I think that's an easy slip road for L&D people. I think content creation, because L&D people really are still plowing the same old let's create courses rut. That's Let's be honest, that's what that industry still is, is still doing. And uh, go to any L&D conference and it's about courses. So that it's unfortunate, it's still true. So I think there's, a, there's room in, in there for some really practical applications. But I think on the fear thing, just going back to that one, I, you know, that's going to happen because people watch too many movies, but they need to calm down. I like Roger, Fra Roger Shank, who's a big AI guy and a big learning guy, said, let's just call it software. That's all it is, guys. There's nothing radical about some of this stuff. We've been using Google for 20 years. You know, it doesn't frighten us when that little thing comes up on the screen, even though it's pure AI. And similarly with chatbots and other bits of tech, these are not as radical as people 
uh, with how, if you work in the field, you know, you realize the limitations. Thank you, Don. And Steve, on that point about fear, so Michelle Parry Slater makes a great point. She says, so is it about the language? AI creates fear, uh, but people are comfortable now with Google because they don't necessarily consciously know it's AI. Hash, just wondering. Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it, how AI over the last 18 to 24 months has come into the public consciousness. I mean, that, that's the first thing. Once it hits the lay media, uh, everyone kind of jumps on the bandwagon and uh, because it's new, because it's different, uh, then people feel a bit uncomfortable about it. I think taking a, taking a step back, there's probably a fundamental um, thing around change in my mind. Um, but one of them is that actually people don't resist change, they resist being changed. So one of the things that we're potentially seeing around the capability of AI and other um, technologies and, and, and other business models and, 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 in, and new norms is this sense that actually what's going on is out of our control. So I think that's the that's kind of the nature. That's what's behind that's what's behind the fear. Um, as I'm sure we all know, there are lots of studies about the potential impact on work and jobs, and and those studies vary from 80% of the jobs will disappear to 5% of the jobs will disappear, but a significant jump number of the jobs will have tasks that are radically different to the way that we see them now. So I suppose you know that all kind of wraps up into this uh, this sense of. Um, being unsure about what's going on, being unsure about the way that the nature of my work is going to change, being unsure about whether I will actually have a job um, in the future. And I think to some extent those fears are, are reinforced by what I see as a relative lack of long-term strategic thinking at governmental level. So if we think about some of the things that Theresa May said in Davos, um, she said, let's make the assumption that global economic growth will continue. And because of that, what we'll do is to create a centre of AI excellence in the UK. And we'll underpin that with some training resources, some education resources, and so on. Actually, what I'd really like to hear is, what if artificial intelligence and other automated systems do take out 50% of the jobs? What then? What are the kind of the policy and the social implications of that? And what are the things that we might need to do? I think once we start to have those conversations, then we can really understand what is it that L&D needs to do in the future? How does the balance between technical training and human skills training change? Because you know, I have an assumption in my head that the more we automate something, the more commoditized those products and services become. So the way that we differentiate is on the human element. You know, so my assumption is that actually it's that that becomes increasingly important in an increasingly digitized world. That's some fascinating stuff in there. Thank you, Steve. So lots for you guys to pick up out on the chat window. I'm keeping an eye on that and, and picking out those points to continue the conversation. So I'll let you kind of have a think about what Steve said there. And I'm going to come to Trish. Trish, um, you talked about AI and, and how that's being sold. And, and Marco, uh, sorry, you responded to Marco saying that it's interesting that AI vendors are not selling AI-driven L&D solutions to L&D. Yeah. They're actually and, selling and them direct AI. to the business. Tell us a bit more about what you see there. Yeah. So here's a, here's a really good example. So most of you are probably not aware that, um, as an example, uh, so some of these tools are becoming are, ubiquitous. Um, so they're not learning technology tools, they're just technology tools that now embed learning. So uh, an example of this would be, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversation uh, about how do we embed learning into workflow. Well, workflow is getting really good at embedding learning in itself. And what that means is if you take a look at productivity tools like Microsoft Office 365, um, so Microsoft Office 365 Online, a subscription service from Microsoft, right? So instead of having to install Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and Outlook and so on and so forth on your uh, hard drive anymore, you can have this subscription online. Well, Microsoft has actually turned that into a learning and performance platform. Um, and they have artificial intelligence algorithms that are running in that productivity software on a regular basis that are close. in gaps in employee productivity and employee performance. 
Um, and we're, again, from a learning standpoint, from an L&D standpoint, we're not even aware that the tool even exists and that Microsoft has even created this. Um, and we're certainly not aware when we go to conferences that Microsoft is actually, um, again, they're avoiding L&D and they're going direct to the business um, because they are using it as, they're using it as a cost-cutting strategy. And again, in some ways, they, um, in some ways they should. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not accusing Microsoft of doing anything underhanded or nefarious, um, but they're, they're leveraging the automation of a toolkit that's going to help organizations actually compete or is helping organizations to compete. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to think about, whether we're talking about learning embedded into productivity tools or learning technologies that are, um, as Steve was just saying, you know, taking over some of the heavy lifting from us and repositioning us again to do more humanistic and more strategic things within value creation. Those are good things, but we're, we're entering an era where organizations and businesses, in order to survive and thrive themselves, are going to have to make these decisions. Um, because if they don't do it, their competitors are, and it, it, it puts them at a significant disadvantage to the point of um, threat. Yeah, and, and Lee, yeah, this is something that we're picking up as quite a theme throughout what's going on. I'm sorry, the lag is the, the lag is off, Joe. Okay, I'm going to jump in and take on, take over. Um, and so one of the things that we're seeing quite a lot is that there's a theme around kind of horizon scanning, looking at the future, strategic thinking, change of mindset, fear, all of those things I think are kind of wrapped up quite nicely. And Debbie, who's our editor-in-chief here at Training Journal, has said everyone, not just learning and development, must be more comfortable with the uncertainty in the future. The world today demands a different mindset. And can we predict anything anymore anyway, or just respond to changes that impact us directly? So some really interesting thought-provoking points there from Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Now, Donald, let's move on to you. You said um, in the chat there's a famous prediction that about 47% of jobs are going to go within 20 years. Uh, and you put in brackets Oxford, so it's come from Oxford, I'm at Oxford University, I'm assuming. You know, L&D conferences, there are two predictions that come up regularly on slide sets. One is the 47% from Frey and Osborne from Oxford. That was in 2013, which used the piece of AI to predict. It turns out that that piece of AI was absolutely hopeless. The classifier was all wrong. So uh, let's forget about that one. Hardly anybody in AI believes that report any longer. The second one is that 63% of all uh, jobs of the, uh, uh, the primary school kids are, are being prepared for will disappear in the future. That quote was actually made up by an L&D person in the States. And I saw it at OEB, a big uh, European conference, and laughed recently. There's no citation for it at all. There's some serious economic work being done here, but this is about augmenting. It's parts of roles will be changing. This is not about the wide scale elimination of jobs. Uh, AI is much more primitive than you might imagine. It really is a bit, it's a, if you work in it, it's an idiot savant. It's incredibly smart at precise things like playing chess, uh, creating content, uh, chatbots and so on. But it's hopeless. So, you know, there, are no, there will be no robot teachers, for example. The idea of a robot teacher is almost surreally absurd. A, it's like having a robot in a self-driving car. You wouldn't have that. Or a robot driving a Roomba picking up dust in your living room. <laughs> it's a, there's, a, there's some really such stupid ideas around an L&D uh, in terms of this sort of, you know, dreaming up, dreaming up fictional, sometimes dystopian and sometimes ridiculously utopian futures in the AI. I think L&D would be, really, I'm, I suppose my advice when, I, when I'm dealing with L&D people is, Calm down, look at very precise tasks within your domain that you may want to apply this technology to. Uh, I think one of them certainly, obviously, in the online learning, L&D, that's really what L&D are using technology for, by and large. And that is, there are great opportunities there for doing things that are better, open input, using voice, 
uh, 3D, all sorts of things, which are all enabled by AI. Have a look at Google Duplex if you want an example of that. Uh, we've just, uh, in Wildfire, we've just completed voice input for learners. So imagine not typing stuff in or doing those dumbass the multiple choice questions, you know, graphic, graphic, multiple choice question, graphic, graphic test. Uh, imagine being able to speak to something. Imagine being having open input in terms of answers. These are all now enabled by AI because we have speech to voice and voice to speech. We have a space practice, for example, which has been ignored by the uh, learning uh, by learning professionals for now on 130 years since Ebbinghouse discovered it. So almost everything that we've heard on this set on this webinar today, people have forgotten because that's what the brain does. It forgets almost everything. But we have a chance of having spaced practice, deliberate practice. The only way of doing that is enabling it through algorithms so it's personalized for Trish, Steve, Joe, whoever, uh, Michelle, Felicity, everybody. We can, we can actually tailor learning to the individual because we now have adaptive learning, personalized learning. These are real things that are happening with thousands, if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of learners as we speak in real projects. So this is not the future in any sense. It's very much present tense. But I think we have to get a bit practical Look at where in the learning journey, where you know for L and D people, where this is going to going to be applied. Uh, I think Steve is right that HR have to look at this. They won't, of course. <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. <laughs> Let, you know, let's be brutally honest here. I mean, I'm, I've, I've been in the HR business. For, they they don't, don't look beyond an annualized budget. This is the truth. I don't know. I, you know, I never meet HR people who have read the latest three books on artificial intelligence. Uh, because they're people people, you know, they're not technology people. And uh, I think we have to be just realistic about this in L&D and look at practical applications that do a good job within our profession. Good job for learners, good job for trainers. Thank you, Don. Some really great points in there, and people are agreeing with you. Marco says, great point, Donald. LMS providers are marketing that their platforms are AI-enabled in that they recommend, etc., but it's mainly built on meta-tagging, which has been around for ages. Um, and Lee says, uh, HR always resists everything. Correct, Donald. And Felicity says, in my experience, HR are quite scared of technology. Uh, and David says, yes, it's the same in Ghana. Okay, so... We've got a few different kind of thoughts here, Steve, around, you know, the idea of the actual robot pushing the vacuum cleaner, for instance, is, is uh, not going to happen. The actual robot sitting there and teaching you in a classroom is not going to happen. So, so what is going to happen? What do you see in the future? Well, I think this idea about uh, robots performing human tasks and using the equipment that humans use is this kind of 60s, 70s science fiction um, uh, type stuff. And, um, uh, and, and Donald's absolutely right. That, that's, that's just not going to happen. Um, uh, the artificial intelligence is embedded in the things that we use. So if we think for a second about autonomous cars, uh, the thing that makes the car autonomous is actually the software built into the machine. Uh, it's not actually being driven by, by a robot. So you know, that's a really good way to think, of, to think about how artificial intelligence is going to be used in everyday devices and objects. I think Donald said some really interesting stuff about the scope and the penetration of AI applications in our existing, in our current world. Uh, and I think that's, that's a really good point to start from. Because if we think how artificial intelligence has evolved into applications across the breadth of domains that Donald just outlined, then just imagine, try and imagine, because I don't think we can really, try and imagine what it will be like in 20 years' time, we'll be just be connecting wirelessly our brains to some kind of device hooked up to the internet when we need to learn something specific. Will we actually stop learning technical things because all that information is available to us, um, either wirelessly um, or at a reference point? Um, this, this idea about human resources um, as a function, I think, is really interesting because I'm not so sure that human resources is a people-focused part of the business anymore. I was at a conference uh, about 18 months ago uh, with uh, human resource directors in, in London, um, and they were being presented with uh, a, a report that looked at some of the trends that we're seeing in, in HR, part of which was the use of, of technology. And one of the issues I raised is, look, if HR wanted to be more strategic, 
then it needs to think about foresight. It needs to take a much more holistic view about the organization as a whole and about the marketplace that the organization is operated in. Um, but the response I got back, and I didn't, don't remember hearing any dissenters in the room, was basically, yeah, we'd like to do that, but we're too busy counting heads. Um, so you know, there's this notion, I think, not just in HR, although I think that's a, that's a, a really good exem exemplar, if that's the right word, of how functions in organizations are so embedded in the pace of change that we're seeing now and looking at changing existing systems and processes and not actually taking a step back and saying, what is it we need to do to change our DNA, to change the organizational DNA? If sectors are going to change as rapidly as we expect, then I guess we have two choices. One of those choices is to play by the rules of the game that we used to. But if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. Um, but as people like Blockbuster and Kodak have found, um, that's just not sustainable. If you do that, you actually step backwards and maybe go out of business. So how do you try to play by the rules of a new game? How do you create a new game? The kind of game that Uber and Airbnb have, have created. Now, if we part the controversy about both those two businesses, really fascinating, isn't it, what they've done? Because actually, they've looked at what clients and customers need. They've developed um, a proposition around those using existing technologies. Let's park the flying cars for a moment, pardon the pun, um, and then build a business model around that. That's really hard for existing organizations to do because you've got to convince the whole of the organization to throw away everything we know so far and do something different. That's really hard. So I think there's a massive challenge about how do existing organizations really change their underlying organizational DNA? How do they develop new perspectives on the behaviors that we need? How do we look at really changing the underlying structure of the organization? So do we need to drop the, uh, the H from HR? Because actually what's going to become increasingly resource, uh, important are resources. Those resources may be employees. They may be contract workers. They may be people in the gig economy. They may be um, very sophisticated, increasingly sophisticated AI uh, devices. So the whole nature of what we mean by work and how we deliver projects, I think, is going to change. And unless we really get our heads around what that means, then I think we're constantly going to struggle and we'll find new organizations, new businesses, smarter, cleverer, more nimble, more flexible, coming in and really sweeping away the, the um, existing players in the marketplace. And if we look at major markets around the world, the major far, uh, uh, financial markets, we can see the churn in those markets. We can see how rapidly existing organizations are dropping out. If we look a little bit deeper, we can see the average age of corporations nowadays is about 30 years. You know, that's halved over the last 50 years. So, you know, this, this, this radical change is affecting everything. Yeah, gone to kind of long-standing organizations. Absolutely, and David is saying, uh, banks in Ghana that used to operate with high labor has now reduced workers more than 60% well, as a result of AI and new banking technology. And I think this is partly um, where that fear comes from, uh, isn't it, Steve? Devel uh, delivering value, particularly to shareholders, because it's profit. So if all these um, uh, automated systems and processes are cheaper than people, What's my motivation as a business owner to do anything other than replace the people with the machines? And we're starting to see that happen in insurance, um, uh, in accounting, in legal. So we're already starting to see it happening right now. Now at the moment, we're in a, we're in a, a quite a healthy global economic growth phase. What happens if that stops? And I, and I think these are some of the big questions that we, that we really have to answer. Yes, we can continue to uh, implement some of the applications that we see now that will help us um, teach, and, uh, teach people and help them to learn and help them gather new experiences. But what are the right experiences to help them gather now in the face of this uh, likely coming change? Yeah, and I think that's something we're going to, to turn to in a little bit more detail in a moment. And um, in the meantime, let me come to Lise. Uh, Lise, you were um, on audio a little bit earlier on, so let's get you on audio again. We seem to have lost Donald Clark, but I'm sure he'll come back um, at some point. He's on hotel Wi-Fi as well, so it's a little bit kind of... Uh, 
tricky. Uh, Lee, let's get you unmuted. You were talking about earlier on in the chat about the best thing about businesses is to remind them that they will not stay in business if they cling to the mindset. And you reference yeah, working at Kodak, and that you an believe that we so have to, to work in different ways. Tell us a bit more about that, Lee. And I found that probably about a third of the ones I've worked for are not in business today, and they were the ones that were the hardest work when I first went in there by saying, oh no, we've been around for ages, we will always stay. And the thing is, I think it's unrealistic to think that what they have right now is going to stay the same way in 20 years. I mean, you know, everything that they have said wasn't going to come has now, it's probably been in existence without being publicized quite a long time ago. I mean, you know, things like Alexa, I bet that was developed years ago. You know, I'm sure that the Roomba, that was probably in, you know, in someone's thoughts probably 50 years ago. Remember when the, somebody said, I think when, probably in the early 70s, well, I don't know if any of you were alive then, but I was. And they said, you know, someday we'll actually have video where people will speak and talk on the telephone. And I thought, no, that's going to mean obscene phone callers are going to have a field day. And look, we're now doing this today. We cannot resist looking at proactive ways of combining new technology with what we have now. And that's how we stay in business. And I think we have to kind of scare companies into saying, you must at least try to think proactively. <laughs> I love Rude. Absolutely. I love the point that you make there, Lise. Thank you so much. And, and hopefully we're not being too rude on the video for you today. But uh, you, you're right. <laughs> it's about changing how we look at things, and I think a lot of people are in the head down dealing with the day-to-day -day of their job, which absolutely needs to get done. But there's another layer, and whether that's management or a different kind of department or way of thinking or working, that need to look at that kind of future. Um, and, and Michelle Paris later saying, ha, no obscenity, please, and David was laughing at that. Welcome back, Don. Uh, we've just been hearing from Lise, uh, who is joining us today, and talking about how we need to move forward in the future. Oh, and now we've lost Trish off a of video, but I think Trish is still here. So I'm going to come to Trish now uh, and see if we can work through the lag. Uh, so Trish, hey, if you Jill, want to here. turn your video off, I can always bring a picture in of you. But I think we might have lost your video stream. Trish, are you still there? Brilliant. I'm going to turn your video off, Trish, but I'm going to bring in a picture of you. So don't worry about that. That might help with our lag just a little bit. So I will bring that on the screen. Here we go. Um, so Trish, we've had a question come in from Diana uh, in Ghana, and she asks, uh, what training sessions are organizations running now that yeah, do include um, so artificial Yeah, an, uh, so an analogy examples, real quick, because um, I think it'll help um, frame yeah. up. So one of the organizations that I referenced before, and Marco, I think, made a comment about it, um, is a company actually based out of New Zealand called Scalytics. Um, and Scalytics, to give you an understanding of the type of offering that Scalytics is doing with their uh, platform, um, would be uh, very much uh, akin to what's happening in professional sports right now. So 2017 was the first year that a lot of professional sports, including the American NFL, um, the National Football League, actually started using streaming analytics in order to influence player performance that then changed the outcome of the game. And so as an example of that, that was how the Philadelphia Eagles actually beat the Patriots, um, the New England uh, Patriots in our, the U.S. Super Bowl. Um, so how does that apply to learning? Well, with a platform like Scalytics, they're doing exactly the same thing. They're leveraging different um, analytics and uh, AI algorithms in order to be able to process 
not only historical data about learners and delegate performance, but also incoming real-time data of delegates and learner performance, and using that to generate fast feedback that helps to inform and influence decisions that learning makes, that the learning function makes, and also helping them to inform and influence um, decisions that managers make around uh, recommended um, recommended actions that they can use uh, in order to coach their direct reports. So if you think of, you know, like a coach in a sport on the sidelines, you know, actually providing an athlete with real-time performance, um, you know, uh, things to help that person advance his or her game in that moment of need as the game is unfolding in the middle of gameplay. We now have that type of technology uh, and those types of AI-enabled platforms in order to be able to do that with employees on the job. Um, same, uh, same across the board. And Scholytics is one of those uh, one of those platforms to do that. Is that helpful, Joe? As as one example. Thank you for talking through that. So, Diana, do let us know in the chat window if that's been helpful to you, if that answered your question. And uh, let's go to Felicity. So, we've got Felicity in the session yes, with here. us. And Felicity, still apparently you've been doing some of this. Don has said that that's uh, something that you do. So, we've got you unmuted. Are you there, Felicity? Okay, so we've used oh, it as a pilot to working to with Tell us a little Don bit more Wildfire. about where and you've used AI for, um, in, an apprenticeship, in training programs um, that you're actually running. Our apprenticeship program where we had to replace our old um, geographical learning. And to do it traditionally using um, e-learning would have taken us about, I don't know, at least six months of time, probably longer, and very expensive. Using the Wildfire AI and Donald's input, we produced Oh, I don't know how many modules there were, Donald. There were sort of maybe a hundred and something plus modules. It came out to well over 80 modules in about six weeks. It did almost kill us doing it in six weeks. Just because you can do it in six weeks doesn't mean you should do. But it actually saved us a massive amount of money as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Felicity, for just highlighting that and telling us a little bit more. And if you go up to your microphone, what you can do is just click that one more time and it will pop you on mute and you can relax. So thank you so much, Felicity, for sharing that. Um, and Don says, the whole project was done without a single face-to-face -face meeting. It sounds good to me. So I've got one last question for each of our speakers and then we're going to go into reflection. So super quick, we'll go to Steve, then Trish, then Don. What is maybe just one thing that um, as an L&D professional that, we should uh, be doing with regards to AI, about the, um, the need to be very focused on what we deliver tactically and operationally now. I think most of our organizations probably do a pretty good job at then looking forward a couple of years to create a budget and a forecast. But the next part that organizations don't do is really use foresight as a methodology to build resilience and flexibility into their organization. I really think there's a massive opportunity for L&D to kind of change the focus of what it does, step back from technical training and look at some of these more holistic, human-focused elements that I think organizations will find increasingly critical. Brilliant, Steve. Thank you so much. And Trish, what is one thing? Exactly thing what Steve was just saying, and that is, I, I mean, you know, in AI. trying to future-proof our careers um, in being able to remain in this space, um, number one is to understand how it is that we can leverage the tools in order to take over some of the routine, mundane tasks. Uh, lots of tools available now in a bunch of different ways. And then the second thing is, then what are the new skills that we need? And um, as this was mentioned before too, they're often skill sets that are outside of the L&D function. Uh, so how do we uh, make sure that we develop new capabilities that uh, keep us not only relevant, but uh, future focused as Steve was just talking about?
Yeah, well, learning people deliver learning. Thank you very and, much, uh, Trish. And then, Don, phone think, question uh, to you. Is there the, one the thing I should be doing as an L&D professional off, as Trish around said, AI you can technology? create content, you know, much more rapidly at about 15 20%, 10% of the cost in about, in minutes, not months. Uh, so why you wouldn't want to do that is completely beyond me. Uh, and so I think we need to get out of this old paradigm of building loads of content at huge expense. Uh, over many months using SMEs that take forever. And so the one thing I'd do is, that, you know, the content creation along with space practice and adaptive learning, these things are real. Uh, you know, you can get them done. It will save you a pile of money, which you can either save or, of course, spend on other more sophisticated things within your L&D orbit. Don, thank you very much. So Steve, Don and Trish, thank you very much for being on video. We are staying here on video. No, we're not staying on video. We're staying here and chatting, but we are going to turn the video off and turn to our reflection. So let's wave a quick goodbye. And I know Trish is waving goodbye as well, even though we can't see her. Let's go into our reflection piece. So we still have our speakers here with us. And we're going to use the text tool to have a little practice first of all. So go and grab the tool on your screen. It's on the left of your screen. It's the T. So once you've clicked on the T, click on the screen, type your name, please, and then click once more, and it will reveal your name to everybody. Uh, so go and do that. Let's have a quick practice with this text tool. And then what we will do is answer our question about reflection. So our speakers are still here. They're still seeing what you're putting. And we're going to come back to them before we finish. But this is all about making sure that we can think about what it is that we've discussed and we're doing and what's that next step. So a little bit like Don was saying earlier on, we don't want to forget everything that's just gone on here. We want to be able to do something with it. Now, if you're thinking, oh, no, my writing is on top of somebody else's, don't worry. Because if you look at the very top tool in your toolbox, you have an arrow pointer tool. And if you click on that, you can pick up and move your name. You can actually move anybody's name if you want to, but you can go and move things around. And Eileen, you've even found the colour, which is absolutely brilliant. And now we're starting to play with all sorts of different um, tools. So if you are on a mobile device, Susan, then you're absolutely right. You don't have the text tool. But Susan, what you can do, and Tanya as well, and you can always write in the chat and I will copy and paste that onto the whiteboard. So let's move on to our actual question. So the question is, what's your action point from today? We've had loads of great... What is it that you are going to be doing after today? We've had loads of great conversation. Loads of links and stuff shared. Thinking about the rest of your day or the rest of your week. Where are you going from here? And Susan and Tanya, you don't have a text tool on the mobile version, but if you type in the chat window, I'll just paste it in for you. Let's look at some of the things that we've got. Somebody said at the top of the screen, I wanted to join today. Oh, let me just move the second one. There we go. I can read it now. I wanted to join today to hear some practical applications of AI to bring the future to the present day. I'm not sure I've got that. And I'm really sorry about that. I think we've had a few bits, but maybe not as much as he'd wanted. But they do go on to say, but I am energised to keep going with my pursuit of AI in my organization as traditional as they are. Okay, so it's brilliant that you've got something from that. And I think I think that energize, energy that you've got from today, I nearly said energization there, that's not even a word, um, I think is a really, really important point. So thank you very much for that indeed. So underneath that, learn more about AI technology, looking to do more research on AI and consider how to use it. Uh, review and play with the Skeletics platform. Uh, reflect and follow up on some of the ideas of today. 
see if there is a specific task I can use AI for. And I think some of the stuff around curation and the content curation is a really great place to start on this because it's relatively quick and easy and there's a variety of tools you can go and do that with uh, all sorts of people will share stuff in the chat window, I'm sure. Uh, more research on AI, try to embed AI within blended learning offering more and more. Plan my five-year L&D strategy. Now, that sounds interesting. Uh, shorter planning cycles. Tech is turning over in 90-day cycles. I'd like to better understand whether modulized learning is viable substitute for healthcare professionals seeking formal accreditation from universities. So that's a really interesting area. And I think Don uh, Clark in the chat said that he's been doing a lot in healthcare. So it might be really great to chat to him about that. And also in the chat, Donald is saying that curation tool available for AI is Wildfire. There's also Anders Pink. There's also, what's the one from Filtered that's changed its name, which I can't remember now. Somebody will be able to pop that into the chat window. Um, Magpie, thank you very much, Michelle. I was thinking Geraldine, but I knew that wasn't right. Um, and uh, what else have we got on here? Uh, check out AI applied to instructional design, such as Wildfire Learning and Volley. AI apply, AI apply to coaching, such as Mobile Coach. AI platform end-to-end, -end, which is Skillitics, and these are all practical examples. All oh, loads more coming up on our whiteboard. Uh, I would focus on AI tools to aid my course creation and delivery. I would embrace AI technology, learn more about it, and keep on updating myself so that I wouldn't be outdated. And that's a really, really important point about the continuous updating. That's the whole point of why we do these training journal webinars for that very reason. What else is on our very busy whiteboard? Uh, looking forward to look at tutor bots as a way of exploring AI. How to convince my company to embrace the change they are totally resisting. And maybe one of those things is, is maybe not call it AI, maybe call it technology or software as has been mentioned. Uh, explore the links and continue to learn. Yes, there were loads and loads of them. I hope you clicked on those as we went through. Uh, did I miss anything? There's one further up the whiteboard. Oh, somebody has just pressed a button they weren't supposed to press. Uh, so the last thing that I saw there was making sure uh, to go and reflect and learn a little bit more about what's going on. Uh, and Michelle says, it's a good point, Joe. It's a name which puts people off, what the magpie name. Um, well, maybe it's all about the kind of the new shiny thing. That's what I think of with magpies. Um, and Steve says, oops, don't give so much control. Ah, oh, Steve, never mind, never mind. Um, oh, and, um, and that's kind of a really good point about personalized technology is I wish I could choose which bits of control I gave you, but you're either a presenter or you're not, unfortunately, but that's no worries at all, Steve. And uh, Michelle says AI. Ah, sorry. So uh, the name AI puts people off is what Michelle is saying. So if we can rename that um, or kind of use it in a different terminology is what uh, Michelle is suggesting. OK, so let's have a really quick last moment uh, thought from each of our speakers before we wrap up today. Uh, so let's go to Steve, first of all. Steve, what's your kind of final parting thought for today's audience? One of the things I found quite interesting before I ruined the whiteboard was that I didn't see anyone talking about what's going on outside their business so one of the thoughts i have is is what is it we're noticing about our clients consumers our customers how they're changing how they're using technology and how can i bring that insight back into the organization to inform l d strategy oh really lovely point there steve thank you so much and let's come to don final thoughts don on our conversation today well, let me pick up on something Steve said there. I think that's an interesting question. What is, what's really happening outside the organizations, if you look over the shoulders of anybody under the age of 25, is that UI is the new, uh, AI is the new UI. So artificial intelligence is the new user interface. Everybody's using messaging, which is chatbot-like. Uh, your, your Facebook, Twitter is mediated by AI. Google is AI. Netflix, 
mediated by AI, Amazon mediated by AI. So everything you do online is mediated in some way by AI. That has to, of course, happen in the learning world. It will happen, of course, because this is the way in which technology has swung. Eight out of the 10 top companies by market cap are essentially AI companies, three of them Chinese, the rest American. Nobody in Europe, of course, since all we want to do is regulate the stuff. That, that, that's, our, that's our role now. But I think Steve's right. I'll look outside the business and see what real learners are doing. And almost everything they do online is mediated by AI. So we must start using this stuff to deliver what we are paid as professionals to deliver, which is learning and development. So the sooner we do this, the better. It's going to happen. Resistance is absolutely futile. So if we don't do it, somebody else will. So let's get on with it. Let's get on with it indeed. Thank you very much, Don. And Trish, last minute thought from you on our conversation today. Yeah, I think, Joe, you know, to both Steve and Donald's point, then that is, you know, this is as sweeping as uh, computers coming into the workplace in the 1990s. Like, this is this is happening. There's no... There are no options here other than, you know, assimilate or go. Um, and, 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 and I don't mean that to be threatening or scary, um, but it, it's uh, reality. And I think in having an understanding that these things are happening, you know, um, with all the conversation about going out and figuring out what AI uh, means to us, First, figure out what AI is, and then take a look at all of the different ways um, that it's disrupting the world around us, and then focus the lens on what's happening internal to L&D. And that, that's been a common theme uh, throughout tonight, uh, well, tonight here in New Zealand as well. So, you know, get a, get a, broader, get a broader lens on what's happening, um, what's happening outside of L&D before looking, before looking internally, and that, that's going to be, I think, surprising. Brilliant, Trish. Thank you. So a really strong message from all three of our speakers there. And thank you so much, Steve, Don, and Trish, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. You know that the session will be available on our website, so you can always go to trainingjournal.com and go and share the recording with your colleagues. Also, you can register for our next webinar, and you can carry on the discussion if you want to on our forum that we've got or on hash TJWOW on Twitter. So go and tell people what you've learned. Go and share a little bit of information about that. And then um, also what we can do is have a look at what's going on with our next webinars. So we've got two more coming up, June and July. One is all about empathy. The other is all about learning transfer. So we really hope that you join us for those. And you can go and connect with us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, and also our speakers too. And we look forward to seeing you another day. And finally, thank you to everyone in the chat window, everyone that joined in today. You are the people that we do this for, and you are what makes these sessions so fascinating and so interesting. Thank you very much, and hope to see you soon.